Hi everyone and welcome to yet another segment of Real History. I am Jared Frederick and the place where I am at today requires almost little explanation. I am at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello, right outside of Charlottesville, Virginia, and it's just such a fascinating place to contemplate a man who was very complex, who was living in America and founding America during very complex times. I think it's an understatement to say that Thomas Jefferson is a man of contradiction, he's a man of moral ambiguity, and oftentimes this is also reflective in a lot of film and cinematic depictions of Thomas Jefferson as well. You, sir, you are a walking contradiction. With all that being said, I couldn't think of a better place to discuss various film depictions of Thomas Jefferson. And so here, sitting on top of Jefferson's Little Mountain, as he referred to it, let's take a look and break down Thomas Jefferson in film. Ken Howard in 1776. When a king becomes a tyrant, he thereby breaks the contract binding his subjects to him. How so? By taking away their rights. Rights that came from him in the first place? All except one. The right to be free comes from nature. What sort of bird shall we choose as the symbol of our new America? The eagle. The dove. The turkey. I think one of the really interesting things about 1776 is that it dives into the moral complexities of slavery in colonial America, and for it being a musical, it has a surprising level of depth to it. And I think in moments like this, it's important for us to ponder the words that Jefferson himself actually said about this contentious issue of slavery here as the Declaration of Independence was being crafted and discussed. He famously remarked about how slavery should be incorporated into the Declaration of Independence, but here's what he had to say on any conversation of that being stripped from the record. He noted that, quote, the clause reprobating the enslaving the inhabitants of Africa was struck out in the complacence to South Carolina and Georgia, who had never attempted to restrain the importation of slaves, and who, on the contrary, still wished to continue it. And he later goes on to say the northern states were essentially complicit in this sort of corrupt bargain because, after all, northerners made money off slavery as well. And it is these same sort of sentiments that are later represented uh, through the character of Edward Rutledge in the famous song Molasses to Rum. Nick Nolte in Jefferson in Paris. Are all men created equal, Mr. Jefferson? Or should this read all white men? We are responsible for these people as members of our most intimate family. He's the best master in all of Virginia, but he is the master, and they have slaves. Jefferson in Paris is, I think, a very overlooked film. Uh, and when you look at the physical similarities between Jefferson and Nick Nolte in this film, I think the casting is spot on. Uh, even though Nick Nolte, I believe, was uh, a number of years older than Thomas Jefferson as he was depicted in the film. I think there is uh, uh, there are certain characteristics in their physical appearance, at least, and there's a certain gravitas to their persona as well. But in regard to the sort of romantic relationships that Jefferson's character has in this film, uh, I think the news outlet, The Guardian, says it best. And this is what they had to say about Jefferson in Paris. Jefferson's younger daughter turns up with a chaperone, Sally Hemings, played by Thandie Newton. Hemings was 14 at this point. Newton, like Gwyneth Paltrow in the film, was 23. Presumably, watching Nolte, 54, when he made this film, compared to Jefferson's 44, cop off with a genuine 14-year-old would be a shade too authentic for modern audiences. And I don't think that's any stretch of the imagination at all. It gets into some of the inherent difficulties of showing uh, these various dynamics and complexities. How do you tastefully show these sorts of things in film? That is something that is not easily solvable for filmmakers. Sam Waterston in Ken Burns's Thomas Jefferson. I have never received the script of a pen from any mortal in Virginia since I left it. 
nor been able by any inquiries I could make to hear of my family. The suspense under which I am is too terrible to be endured. If anything has happened, for God's sake, let me know it. God forbid we should ever be 20 years without such a rebellion. What country can preserve its liberties if their rulers are not warned from time to time that their people preserve the spirit of resistance? I am a big fan of Ken Burns. I think that he is a masterful storyteller, and I think in many ways he has done perhaps more than any other American in modern memory to uh, capture people's interest in the American story. Um, although he did have some critics and people who he had to convince in the making of this documentary on Thomas Jefferson, including the historian Joseph Ellis. And this is what Joseph Ellis had to say about this documentary. Film is all about exteriors and observable action. The essential Jeffersonian action occurred inside his head, a place no camera could go. He was a man of words and ideas. Jefferson is America's everyman, and not just any man who can be everyman. The best and worst of American history are inextricably entangled in Jefferson, so anyone who confines his search to one side of the moral equation is destined to miss a big portion of the story. Jefferson is like one one of those dirigibles at a Super Bowl, floating above the stadium and flashing inspirational messages to both teams. And I think in saying so, uh, Joseph Ellis gets to this myopic and almost bipolar nature and mystery that Thomas Jefferson is. And I think in showing that, Ken Burns most definitely succeeds. Sam Neill in Sally Hemings, An American Scandal. Well, perhaps I was too rash. She kept begging me to let her go. And now she has a wish. I can only hope that I have done the right thing by sending her to convent school. But after all, she was correct. Convent schools do offer the best, the best education. Yeah. Why are you looking at me like that? I find I enjoy looking at you, Sally. I so love your touch. I find I need your touch even when I'm perfectly sound. I cannot explain it. I think one of the really interesting formulas in Sally Hemings and American Scandal is that we have a far more strengthened interpretation of Sally Hemings than what we see in the film made just a few years prior with Nick Nolte. And on this point, uh, Danielle Gorman in an article for Lehigh University had this to say, about the film. The Sally shown in this film is more empowered and self-righteous. Yet does altering Sally's demeanor defeat the point of honoring her place in history? In telling the story of Sally Hemings, a black slave whose alleged relationship with Jefferson was considered scandalous and immoral, is it right to portray her as a more tolerable version simply so we can stomach it? Is it counterproductive to the historical record and advancement of society to honor an African-American slave through the guise of someone more civilized and and white. And so this is an inherent trap that filmmakers find themselves in. Should Sally Hemings be depicted as a submissive slave who is taken advantage of or as an empowered woman that we should be in inspired to look up to? Uh, and so here too, these are some of uh, the troubled issues that filmmakers may confront when considering the life of Thomas Jefferson. Stephen Delane in John Adams. Well, that's not what I intended, Dr. Franklin. Slavery is an abomination and must be loudly proclaimed as such, but I own that neither I nor any man has any uh, immediate solution to the problem. No. <clears throat> we hold these truths to be sacred and undeniable, that all men are created equal, uh, etc. <clears throat> Smacks of the pulpit. Does it? Uh, these truths are self-evident, are they not? Perhaps. Self-evident, then.
We've taken an extensive look at John Adams here on Real History, and we invite you to explore some of our previous episodes that look at some of the segments of that iconic HBO film. And there are some issues to quibble with. It is not a historically perfect film, although it is cinematically masterful. And likewise, the Journal of the American Revolution acknowledged these sorts of traits and strengths and inherent weaknesses in its own review. And this one reviewer, noted of the miniseries. Though in a series this long, there are bound to be inaccuracies. It is unlikely a television history will ever be this authentic again. Scene after scene thrilled. Among my favorite was a customs agent being tarred and feathered in Boston Harbor as a mob tears off his clothes and rides him out of town on a rail. It brought home how this too often humorously portrayed punishment must have been excruciating in real life. Likewise, I think one of the great strengths of John Adams, especially in its depiction of Thomas Jefferson, is that it shows how politically divisive people's attitudes of the times could be, that politics had the ability to tear friendships apart, especially for the likes of John Adams and Thomas Jefferson. And I think in conveying these thoughts of the early republic, John Adams most definitely excels. Some of these films are feature films, some of them are documentaries, Others are miniseries, but all of them to one extent or another offer a somewhat nuanced interpretation of Thomas Jefferson that is worthy of our consideration as a cultural product. I really enjoy visiting historic sites and contemplating the, the impact that cinema has and film has on people who come here, the various interpretations that they make of historical characters, uh, but nothing can beat coming to the real place, walking in the footsteps of these real individuals and learning the story firsthand. And I encourage you to do much the same right here at Thomas Jefferson's Monticello. We'll see you next time on Real History. Facts are stubborn things.